Good evening, and I have the distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Nita Crawford, uh, and a recipient of our 2019 uh, Peace Worker Award. Um, Dr. Crawford has dedicated her academic and professional careers to understanding and exposing the costs and consequences of war, which is extremely important as we carry out our work as peace activists. Uh, an alumni and former professor at Brown University, Dr. Crawford completed her PhD in political science at MIT and currently serves as a professor in the chair of the political science department at Boston College. Her, University. University, excuse me. Her teachings focus on uh, international relations theory, international politics, and normative change. Uh, her literary works include Accountability for Killing, Moral Responsibility for Collateral Damage in America's Post-9-11 Wars, which personally helped me in one of my college essays, so thank you, and Argument and Change in World Politics, Ethics, Decolonization, and Humanitarian Intervention. Dr. Crawford is the co-director of the Eisenhower Study Group, Costs of War. You can visit their website at costsofwar.org. That is packed with statistics about the externalities of US militarism. We welcome Dr. Crawford today at Peace Action Maine to further our understanding of the costs of war and the importance of our work as peace activists. Dr. Crawford pillars the peace movement with her research and courage to challenge our military industrial complex. And we appreciate all that you do for the peace movement. And thank you for joining us tonight. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I spent the entire day today before hopping in the car to come here at a nonviolent direct action training in Somerville, Mass, uh, put on by Extinction Rebellion. And I'm on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday going to uh, lectures about Gandhian nonviolence. It's all coming together. Oh, so what I want to talk to you today about is the Pentagon, climate change, and war. But I'm going to first give you a little introduction to the Cost of War project. And um, I, I'm not assuming that everybody knows about it. Who, who's heard of it? OK, so it might be useful for you. I'll tell you about the latest findings of the project. So the Cost of War project is based at Brown University and now also Boston University. We just moved part of the project to be BU and the RD Center for the Study of the Longer Term Future. I've been a co-director of the project since 2010, which is when we began. And we've been looking at all sorts of things to do with the cost of the post 9-11 wars, including, as it says here, alternatives and opportunity costs, domestic political consequences in terms of civil liberties and uh, human rights, the budget, which I do the work on, lives lost, which is another one of my areas where I focus, uh, injury to humans, and migration. Um, and so you see some of the images here. The, the image at the top right is, of course, the uh, Twin Towers. But below, not looking all that different, is uh, the result of a drone strike in Pakistan. So I'm actually going to move. Can I? I guess I can't. I have to stay here. I wanted to sort of, this is, I have notes, but they're too tiny to, to actually see what it says. So, so my job with the project is not just to work with um, the people, the roughly four dozen people who've made contributions to the project and contributed individual papers, but I actually write a few papers for the project, uh, one of which is on the economic uh, the economic consequences for the budget, the budgetary toll of the mobilization after 9-11. And what we see here, that you're looking at now, are the results of the latest paper I've done on the US military budget. It hasn't been publicly released yet. I'd appreciate it if you actually don't tell people this number. We're going to release it um, in the Capitol at the Senate on the 13th of November. But this is my new number. If you go to the website now, it says 5.9 trillion. This is the new number for FY 2020, assuming that the new defense budget is uh, passed by the Senate. And right now, it's, it's not yet passed. Um, so what you see here are the various categories of spending that are associated with the post 9-11 wars. And I've been tracking 
these categories as the DOD budget increases. Um, if you look here, the, the light blue, if you can't read it, that's DOD worst spending. The sort of brownish maroon color is cost of, cost of veterans care in the future. Okay, then the, the purple is what we've already paid for veterans medical and disability. The uh, interest on borrowing is in green. So in other words, this war, these wars were paid for unlike any other wars in US history by borrowing. There were no war bonds sold beyond the first few patriot bonds and taxes were not raised. We went into deficit spending after 9-11 to pay for the wars and the subsequent tax breaks of the Bush and Trump administrations. Um, then we see uh, the Homeland Security spending. Now the Department of Homeland Security is new, but those missions are old, and so you see a lot of uh, focus on Homeland Security missions. And if you read the Department of Homeland Security report, they describe as one of their central missions uh, combating, preventing, and responding to terrorist attacks. Then you also see uh, a category here which I call estimated increases on the base military budget. Just a quick primer on that. There's really two parts of the, the military budget. The, there's the base budget, which are seven bills that are run through a regular appropriations process, and then there's the war budget, the OCO, Overseas Contingency Operation Budget. So the base budget is what funds everything that's not war immediately, right? It funds the, the installations and training and so on. So that's grown above what it would have been absent the United States being at war. In other words, there's a sort of inflationary effect and not just uh, on the base budget, the base military budget. So it's not just war spending we need to keep track of. We need to keep track of base military spending. Then there's State Department spending and um, uh, a new category this year called Overseas Contingency Operations for Base, which if, if you're interested, it, it, it's a way that um, the Trump administration is now flouting U.S. law in a whole new way. And we can go into that in Q&A if you're interested. Then um, what I want to just do is break those costs out again and you can see that a large portion of this is the direct war budget, but, it's, but increasingly what we're gonna see over time is the spending to take care of veterans will overtake the war budget. And in fact, between 2020 and 2050, 60, uh, this will vastly exceed direct military spending. Um, we could talk a lot about veterans, but one of the facts about the, the post-9-11 wars is these veterans are sicker than the veterans of previous wars in various ways. But one of them is respiratory illness. But because of repeated deployments, they also have a lot of musculoskeletal damage. And um, then because people are surviving in war zones like they couldn't survive in past wars, they come home injured in various ways which would have otherwise killed them. And that's requiring complex care, which is why it's more expensive. The veterans are sicker, cost more, and they've got, uh, in some ways, unique injuries. Uh, the multi-amputations that you see just it would have killed people in previous wars, these traumatic amputations. So let me then tell you a little bit more about what else we're finding with the Cost of War Project, and I want to then switch quickly into the greenhouse gas paper. But this chart, which is kind of hard to read, explains something that I mentioned earlier, which is how the base budget has grown. It's been inflated. And what I want you to pay attention to are, are right here. 2004, overseas contingency operations spending goes down slightly. Base military budget goes spending goes up. Okay, then again, 2009, there's a little decrease in spending over the previous year's spending, but base military spending goes up in the black. So the OCO spending, the, the war spending, is the hash column, and the base spending is going up. Does anybody want to ask questions about that? So this happens in several years, 2004, 2009, 11, 
12, 15, 16, 18, 19, and 20. So if there, in other words, space military spending is inflated by these wars. So this effect will stick with us after the wars end. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about this, but uh, one of which is it's, it's harder to sort of track what's going on in the, in the war world. Okay, um, the only year that's an exception to that is 2013, highlighted in red, when overseas contingency operation spending went down a little bit, and so did the, the base budget. Then you can see the same thing here. Red is overseas contingency, that is war spending, and blue is the base budget. You see the same trend. Okay, and then here I've broken out spending by the war zones, and, and you can see that, uh, it, that after their peak, Spending has gone down on these wars. It's an indicator of the intensity of war, the, the spending. And it's also, um, at the, if we put on another chart, the spending on veterans, you see veteran spending will go up. War spending goes down, veteran spending goes up. Now, and I also do the, the analysis of the consequences for the war for civilians and other humans in the war zones. And I, in particular, have tried to focus on, uh, when I talk about Afghanistan, not just Afghanistan, but Pakistan, since the war is, about, is really occurring in both places. But here I've just shown you the, the trend in Afghanistan deaths. So look, war spending's gone down. The United States is withdrawing from Afghanistan, yet civilian casualties are, are growing. And the, the column on the far right for 2019 is only half the year. And it, the, the war is on track to exceed. Uh, it will probably be the highest number of civilians killed as the U.S. withdraws. Um, a lot of reasons for that. We can talk about it in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, okay, but, but really this, uh, I'll just say one thing about it. This uptick in the fighting in the last year is about the negotiations and the Taliban and the Afghan government and the U.S. trying to get leverage. Okay, now let's quickly talk about how um, the, this relates to greenhouse gases and, and uh, war and climate change. Okay, so you can calculate your own individual carbon footprint. You may have go, gone online and tried to do that. Uh, it's kind of an interesting exercise. You know, so if you vary the number of flights that you do, your carbon footprint goes down and so on. Well, I wanted to calculate the Pentagon's carbon footprint. It had, hadn't been done before. There is not an analysis of that. And why did I want to do that? Well, I was teaching a class on climate change last year at Boston University. And I was doing a lecture on something. And I, I said, well, there must, somebody must have done this. And I went to look in there. And no one had done it comprehensively. There are, there are a few estimates for different years. So I thought that'd be important. Uh, and I wanted to, to just check on what I had heard anecdotally in the peace movement for the last 30 years, which was the Pentagon uses the most fuel of any institution in the world. And so two and two together, then it must be a, a huge greenhouse gas emitter. And I, I found no evidence for that uh, that was consistent, so I looked. Um, so I did the calculation. But you can't find uh, this number easily. Uh, you can sort of guess when you look, for example, that um, on the top line what we see is total federal government energy consumption from 1975 to 2018. And then the, the line below that is DOD energy consumption, Department of Defense energy consumption. What you see is that, that the Department of Defense dominates the energy consumption of the United States government. Okay, still didn't tell me how much greenhouse gas. So then I had to do the calculation, uh, the footprint of the whole thing. There were some estimates for years and you could um, get a sense that perhaps in year, war years it would go up you'd think, and so I, I looked, um, but I did know that it was likely to be a very large number because the U.S. military is everywhere. It has commands everywhere, um, and 
a lot of that fuel is, uh, that is consumed by the military goes to take care of this pink area, which I, is, it's hard to see, Central Command. Uh, this area right here, Central Command. <coughs> right, we're in NORTHCOM. And Central Command is where the wars are, the major wars. Um, okay, so obviously the United States is a military like no other. It has a global presence. And the global war on terror following 9-11 is also glo is global, right? That's why it's called the global war on terror. It's in between 80 to 90 countries, including the major war zones. And this is a map produced by the Cost of War Project. If you want to go look at it, you can get the details. These are some of the uh, uh, major activities. Now, all of this obviously requires enormous fuel. And so General David Petraeus says energy is the lifeblood of our war fighting capabilities. So how do they get all this energy where they need to have it um, and, and have it be used in war? Well, they have something called the Defense Logistics Agency, which supplies the fuel for fighting. And, and they say that our footprint is global, and you can see their commands. They have commands within each command. Uh, but they don't tell you how much is consumed. They tell you how much oil is bought, or how much fuel is bought. They don't tell you how much is consumed. There's not always a one-to-one -one relationship. So I could get some of the numbers I wanted from there, but then I had to, to go deeper. And so I had a bunch of questions, and here they are. What are the greenhouse gas implications of uh, the US wars, and war in general, and the permanent military establishment for that class in 2018? Could those emissions be reduced? And then I had to, I needed some data, which, um, what were the greenhouse gas emissions at the beginning of the global war on terror? And uh, what are those trends in emissions? And then how could war and non-war emissions be reduced? Would you need different techniques? Now, of course, the military, being the military, does things differently than everybody else. It thinks about its fuel use and energy consumption in two baskets, basically. Installations or bases and operations. So. Here's the consumption for installations. It's roughly 30% of the whole pie of consumption. And it's divided up here by service. So uh, in green is the Army, uh, blue is the Air Force, and uh, then there's the Navy on top there. And then there's sort of defense agencies. Now what's interesting about this is they're roughly the same, right, the major Uh, services are the same, roughly, in any one year, for bases and installations. Okay, here we see uh, energy use bro brought, worked out a little differently um, by f fuel and by sector, so activities. And then, then you have to look at the 70% of energy use that's for operations, most of it, right? So installation and base is 30%, 70% is operations. And if you can read that, if you could read it, if you went up there and looked closely, what do you think you'd see? Does anybody tell? Anybody read that well? The Air Force, right. And the other parts of the services that have lots of aircraft, right? That, that basically it's aircraft that account for most of the operational fuel use. And uh, okay, why? Well, the US engages in power projection over the entire globe, right? So you project power uh, unless you have a base right there with aircraft and aircraft carriers. Okay, then there's another way of looking at this which is, you see again, you see jet fuel is the main thing here that's uh, more than 50%, right? And then you also see renewables as a slice. Gasoline, uh, fuel oil, diesel, natural gas. This is in 2018 for 
these fuel types, which are basically for the operational part. Then, um, okay, so then you add it all up. And this is what it looks like. Jet fuel. So th this is the, the, not just 2018, but the period from 1975 to the, the most recent year that I could get data for, 2018. Okay, why? Are there just a lot of jets? Well, it turns out jets are really inefficient. Like every time you take a flight, that's a lot of fuel use, greenhouse gas emissions, but military uh, aircraft are even more inefficient because they're doing something quite special, which is carrying special equipment and flying at higher altitudes and so on. Um, and here are some examples of how many gallons per mile they get. Not miles per gallon, but <laughs> gallons per mile. So you could see here that the newer they get, the newer they are, the better mileage they get. So that's one of the things that the RAND Corporation and others have said, well, we just have to modernize, buy more new stuff to get more efficiency. Okay, you could do that. Um, okay, but that still doesn't tell me everything I need to know. And why don't we know these numbers? Um, first of all, the DOD doesn't consistently publish its numbers. They don't tell con Congress. Explicitly, they're told not to tell Congress about consumption. That's in their worksheets. They have to fill out before they make presentations. The Environmental Protection Agency does not usefully aggregate the numbers for fuel use. And states, this is the big one, governments are not obliged to count military emissions in the Kyoto Protocol. You may have thought that the Kyoto Protocol will tell you everything you need to know about a country's emissions because there are standards there. Well, military emissions were explicitly omitted from Kyoto Protocol the Kyoto Treaty. And this was, uh, I have here a text um, from Stuart Eisenstadt who tells us why. And you don't have to read the whole thing. Basically, it says, at Kyoto, the parties took a decision to exempt key overseas military activities from any emission targets, including exemptions for bunker fuels used in international aviation and maritime transport and from emissions resulting from multilateral operations such as self-defense, peacekeeping, and humanitarian relief. And then he continues, this exempts from our national targets not only multilateral operations expressly authorized by the UN Security Council, such as Desert Storm or Bosnia, remember this is late 1990s, but importantly also exempts multilateral operations that the US initiates pursuant to the UN Charter without express operation, such as Grenada, or let's say the 2003 invasion of Iraq. So it, they're not obliged to report this information. And it's really not part of the national count. OK, so how do, you, how do we then understand what's going on? Um, you could go to the Department of Energy, which has more data. That's what I did, but they don't have all the information. They only have 2009 and, and 2010 to 2018. So I wanted to get the whole set of wars since 2001. So I had to estimate it. And I'm not going to go into super great detail on this, but I have the slides here if you're really quite interested in the math. Who's really into the math? <laughs> you're really into the math? We'll meet afterwards. Anybody else really into the math? Okay, just assume I, I, I went to MIT, so I can probably multiply. She's just asking you about it, and I couldn't Okay, so, so ba basically, um, this is what the Department of Energy reports. But the, remember, the Department of Energy doesn't use the same categories as the, as the Department of Defense. They're talking about uh, standard and non-standard emissions. So standard emissions are the things you do in everyday life. Non-standard emissions are war-related, combat-related. Okay, so who has that category? Which departments? Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. Right, they have these uh, combat-like sort of militarized functions. 
So the uh, Homeland Security has, for instance, the Coast Guard, which is meant to patrol the coast, not just rescue you, but look out for nefarious actors. Okay, so, uh, so the DOD and the DOE don't use the same categories. The installations and operations for the DOD and standard and non-standard operations for the DOE. That's why I went to MIT, so I could speak in acronymical times, right? <laughs> Okay, so then I did an estimate over time using the data that I could get um, from what was spreadsheet after spreadsheet of fuel used for each fuel. Okay, so here it is. This is what I found. From 1975 to 2018, what do you see? Yeah. That's right, it's gone down. What, where's the biggest or the steepest decline? Can you see the numbers here? Right, so between 1991 and two, before 2001, right, what happened? Peace. Peace. End of the Cold War. Right, exactly. Wow, there was a greenhouse gas dividend, not just a peace dividend. Okay, but then after 9-11 it goes up, not only anticipated, but then it starts to go down. Oh my gosh, that's a puzzle. I'm a social scientist, why do I, why do I, why did I become a nerd like this? Because social scientists are actually detectives. It's like, okay, put on my, my uh, Sherlock Holmes hat. And I try to figure out why after this rise that's associated with escalation in these wars, did it go down? Um, and here, let me just give you the results for the whole period. If you didn't do it year by year, you wouldn't, and, and plot it like this, you wouldn't know the, the trend, so that's why I did it. Okay, so here are the, the total emissions. You don't have to memorize those numbers, but what you can see is that war is a good chunk of that, good chunk of the emissions. I'll go backwards and show you. Okay, so the top line there is total emissions. Uh, the standard emissions are the bottom line, and the middle line is the war, okay? Um, and they track each other, right? Because as the DOD admits, what happens at installations is not unrelated to what's going on overseas. Right? There's training, there's uh, pre-deployment to a base, and then actual deployment and so on. Okay. Now, then I focused on the global war on terror, and there you see from, I give you the year before 2001, and I get you through to the most recent year for which there's data, 2018. And again, you can look at this downward trend in standard and non-standard emissions. And if you look carefully, non-standard emissions declines a little more quickly in the 2011 period. So there's war emissions decline. What's happening then, do you know? Remember? I know this is, you know, it's an 18-year war. It's hard to keep track, right? But do, do you remember what was happening around 2011? The U.S. withdrew largely from Iraq, right? There was a little escalation in Afghanistan in 2009, but then the, the, big, with the big troop numbers, there was a withdrawal from Iraq. So that's why standard emissions, non-standard emissions decline. Okay, but then there's also something really interesting happening, and I'll look at, again at the whole period. Um, look at this jet fuel, tracking jet fuel. Gasoline use is roughly constant. There's this dip in diesel use, and I don't know why. And then it goes back up. <coughs> with, um, so some more puzzles. All of this isn't super important, right? The big story is what we want to get, but these, these little things um, give you some clues about the, what, what's happening in the long run and what to look for. So then I looked at facilities energy use, right? So um, here we go with that. Again, steep decline after 1991, end of the Cold War. Why does facilities use go down? Any guesses? Closing bases, we went from 1,600 bases peaking in 1990-ish. 
to now about 800 or so installations all over the world. But still, there's no power in the history of the world who's had this many installations and bases at 800. Right? So the, it's, it's still an enormous global footprint, which is why that map of defense installations shows you dots everywhere where the, the fuel use is going on. Um, then I'm going to show you the fuel use again in a different way, which is 1975 and 2018. On the left is 1975. You see fuel oil is used, and uh, natural gas are a big component. Okay, and then that's on the right is 2018. Okay, so um, I guess it didn't work to give you the numbers on that, but you don't. I'm not sure that it's all that exciting to need to know each little ounce of fuel used. But what you see is what? What do you see happening between 1975 and 2018? Right, and different kinds of fuel. Yeah, and then you see this little tiny thing in there. Uh, coal drops, look at coal. Coal on 1975 versus in 2018. I'll show you the 2018 numbers again. You can see much more detail on this slide. What you're looking at is the rise of electricity generation by some means, and I can't tell you how, actually. I don't know. Another mystery. Decline in fuel oil, increase in natural gas, right? Uh, the huge decline in coal. That's important because coal is a much more greenhouse gas intensive fuel which tells you a little bit why this is complicated because you have to calculate the greenhouse gas intensity of each fuel. Each one of these fuels is a d different level of destruction. Think of it that way. Different uh, emissions profile and therefore each gas that is emitted means that let's say if I'm burning coal versus natural gas, I'm, uh, you can see that you have greater heat absorbed from coal than from natural gas emissions. Okay, so, but I didn't, I couldn't estimate everything, and what didn't I estimate? I couldn't, I, I didn't do a serious calculation of U.S. <coughs> military industry, which we must include, right? Which, if you look at the employment numbers, about 15% of everybody employed in, in industry in general is employed in a military industrial capacity, 15%. And then I, you could do an estimate on that, which I did. I'll show you in a second. Then I didn't look at the emissions from targeting petroleum in war. And as you see in the recent wars since 1990, the 1991 Gulf War, targeting oil facilities is a large part of what happened. Now that happened also in World War II and in the Korean War, you target the other side's energy capacity. But uh, here, there's the, the deliberate destruction as armies are moving or withdrawing. So the Iraqis in, in 1991 destroyed Kuwaiti oil fields. The United States has destroyed uh, ISIS oil. And if you looked at your paper today in the New York Times and also in the Washington Post, there was a story about how Secretary of Defense Mark Esper is promising to defend the oil feeds, fields in Syria from attack and capture by ISIS. Okay, and then you, you know you remember about a month ago, uh, the somebody attacked Saudi oil fields. So I haven't calculated the greenhouse gas emissions from those the burning, because I don't know how much fuel was burned. Um, and it's crude oil, so it, again it has a different. Uh, emissions capacity plus technically there are other things that are emitted, you know, different size gases, I'm, I'm sorry, particulate matter, which absorbs sunlight. Um, then I haven't estimated a huge thing, which is the energy consumed by reconstruction of damaged and destroyed infrastructure. Why is that important? Because cement is a big part of that, and cement is a large greenhouse gas produ production emitter. Okay. Um, and then if you have to rebuild what you've just bombed and then rebuild it and rebuild it, it's, it's quite intense. I haven't done that estimate. 
Um, and then I haven't looked at the emissions from other chemicals like fire suppression chemicals and so on. But let me just give you the uh, my quick and dirty estimate of military industrial emissions here, which that's quite significant. In any year, the military industrial emissions far surpass the military's own emissions. Okay, so you, if you had to add them up, that's this is my estimate. I don't I don't publish this number or publicize it widely because it's really crude. It's a, it's. The military's own emissions. So the military, military industry meaning? Meaning Dynamics. Boeing or yeah, yeah. General Dynamics, Dynamics. Okay. Raytheon. Right. How is that? Well, it's because constructing things takes um, energy. And that's a, this is a very crude uh, estimate. Okay, so I'm not going to stand by each the numbers down to the decimal point. I'm, I'm basically, this is what you're looking at, though. Okay, so and then here's some images of what happens when you attack oil fields, and that's not uh, great, and that's what hap happened recently and will continue to happen. And I, I think I'm actually at the point where I'm, I'm thinking of destroying oil fields as a war crime um, because it's indiscriminate, right, in, the, in its emissions, which affects all humans. Then there's a question, which way are we going to go? And I want to talk now about the way the Pentagon sees things and how um, the, co the popular culture sees things. I think that there's, there are three options here. There's reform, transformation, or we're going to go to hell in a handbasket. Now, the popular culture is fond of hell in a handbasket. Here's a, an image from the movie Tank Girl where the, the world is so dry that this guy who's, it's um, Rod McDowell's brother, Andy McDowell, I think, I've forgotten. Anyway, McDowell here is, is uh, using a device to suck the water out of a human, and then he's gonna drink it in the next scene, which is pretty gross. And then here and below you see Mad Max Fury Road, which is all about a post-apocalyptic world where people are struggling to get water and fuel. Then there's another way of looking at things, which is from, let's say, Octavia Butler, which is a new world is coming. This is, there's a possibility for regeneration. Then we go back to the academics. Now, the academics are convinced that um, war is coming with climate change. And so, in a lot of ways, is the Pentagon. So there's, but there's two, two different takes. There's the academic take, and then there's the spiritual take. Um, the spiritual take is we're all beings in this planet and we need to uh, think about community and cooperation. Now, the Dalai Lama here is talking about humankind and concern for the whole of humanity, but I take your point that we should be concerned with all beings. And so, in other places, the, does the Dalai Lama reference them? And then the Pope in Laudato Si talks about love and using the crisis of climate change to spark a new way of being. In many religions, not just um, uh, Buddhism or Catholicism, many religions uh, have climate statements and they look to see a new way of being. For all our limitations, gestures of generosity, solidarity, and care cannot but help, cannot but well up within us since we were made for love. That's the message of the Pope, among other things. He says, all is not lost. And then he describes all these things that humans are doing everywhere to deal with climate change. Okay, the military is not into any of that except for the climate war stuff, right, and, and uh, other things. So I want to tell you a little bit about how they think about climate change. They think of it as having essentially um, three, con four, three or four consequences. One is the operational challenges. As the world gets hotter and wetter, it's harder to do things. Um, and your bases may be inundated. Then there's resource scarcity. So they're worried about access to their own resource needs and resource competition. So if you're going to be doing the, the rescuing, which is the institutional overwhelmed, it's going to take away resources to do the fighting that you want to do. And they're concerned about increased conflict. And in some of their 
um, literature, they talk about the potential for even nuclear war, but certainly wars over water. Um, and then you know that the military's been thinking about this for a long time. Here's a paper from the uh, early 1990s, I think it's May 1990, at the Naval War College. Somebody gave a paper talking about the challenges of uh, the opening of the Arctic, which hadn't yet obviously happened, and uh, looked forward to the challenge of rising sea levels at bases and other problems. So the, obviously the Navy is very aware of what's going on with the ocean. They've been watching it quite carefully. So by 2017, they say climate change is impacting stability in areas of the world where our troops are operating today. So not war is coming, war has come. And it's partly due to the stresses induced by climate change. And, um, you know, th but again, the Defense Logistics Agency, which gives them the oil to, that will increase the capacity to burn um, uh, oil in pursuit of missions, um, wants to make sure they have enough in these locations, right? So the mission of protecting the Persian Gulf is unchanged, essentially. Uh, protecting access to Persian Gulf oil is crucial. So that's why Mark Esper's statement about protecting access to Syrian oil fields is important. The mission continues. It's been that way since 1980. Not rethought, even as U.S. dependence on Gulf, Persian Gulf oil has declined. It's much lower. Okay, so then uh, if you look at various uh, scenarios about the consequences of climate change, you see a lot of modeling. And here is unclassified modeling by, uh, in a report called The Age of Consequences that came out in 2007. And it has various scenarios that they take their scenarios from the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. So they take what the IPCC has told us might happen, and then they project it into to political and social unrest. And um, they have what the expected scenario is, and this is an old report, so they're actually, um, that's, that's, that's not likely to happen. The expected scenario is actually much more dramatic, but they, they foresee increased tension. Then they say there's, there's a severe scenario, much more increased tension, and then if, if this, nothing happens by 2100 to mitigate and reduce, draw down, and feedback loops occur, then we're into catastrophe. So they urge the military to prepare for that, but they don't urge the military to prepare for that by reducing their own emissions. Remember, the emissions are as high as, let's say, the country of Portugal, or Sweden, or Denmark in any one year. Right? They're not saying reduce your emissions, they're saying get ready for conflict. And this image right here is the worst thing that could happen would be that the circulation of warm water and cold water in the world would essentially stop, and then you're talking a, a, a huge disaster for, in terms of growing, growing food. So um, they're concerned, and this concern was fairly consistent through the Obama administration, uh, with, where the national security strategy in 2015 said climate change is urgent, an urgent and growing threat to our national security, contributing to increased natural disasters, refugee flows, and conflicts over basic resources like food and water. Again, business as usual, this gets worse over time. So in, tw in 2009, one of the reasons why, if we go back to that image of a declining emissions, one of the other reasons that the emissions decline is in 2009, the president said, you must decrease overall emissions. And the military said yes, and they did for many reasons, including the order. Okay, so they're also, as I said, concerned about uh, other impacts to their security. And here's a, a, a map of the bases that are, effect, are affected now by climate change. 
and some of the statements that they've, where they've indicated their grave concern. And then you also see here um, some facilities. Here's Ofut Air Force Base, which was inundated in March of this year because of the rising Missouri River. And next is uh, another base you might be familiar with, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Uh, very vulnerable, talk about it a lot. And here's the, the one that they're really concerned, the Navy's really concerned about, which is Newport Naval Station. They've got 13 piers, they need to be elevated. Here they've done some modeling of the inundation for storms and just uh, king tides, large high tides. Okay, but then the Trump administration said, hold it, not happening. They don't, they don't believe in climate change, so they, they didn't have it in the next national security strategy. And lo and behold, 100 members of Congress wrote to the administration and said, put it back in. It needs to, we need to think about it. All right, so largely the reaction has been to be concerned with conflict. Um, but again, we've, we've talked about how they've reduced their uh, overall emissions. And they, they've done it for a couple reasons. Um, not just because they've been told to, but they want to reduce their vulnerability, their operational vulnerability. And so they've, they've really, the Marines in particular, really invested in solar and all sorts of ways to keep their tents at optimal temperatures that are efficient. So uh, when the, the, mil the Marines tell you that they're green, they have a whole program that's, the acronym is GREEN, but they don't really mean they're green in, in that they're caring about climate. They're really caring about operational vulnerabilities, which is a fine thing because they're still reducing emissions. And they've got roadmaps and all sorts of strategies to deal with climate change. Um, here's how we think about the link between conflict, war, and climate. And very quickly, I want to just say that um, none of this is inevitable, right? You don't necessarily have to, to go to war in, in the case of stresses over fresh drinking water, but this is how they think, that climate stresses will increase conflict, which will lead to migration, and then that's going to increase conflict, and um, climate change will uh, cause more migration and so on. It's this loop, but, they, but what's missing here is the link between conflict and climate change, right, in the sense that um, preparing for conflict produces climate change. So they're interested in famine early warning systems and migration, but not really so concerned with um, their own contribution in that sense. So I'm actually going to, um, because I've talked more than I should have, I'm going to skip a couple slides um, and just move to this one uh, and talk a little bit about this loop between war and climate change, climate change and war, and the importance of reducing military emissions and getting the military off the mindset that the way to respond to disruptions is through force and the preparation for force. That's just a, a loop that gets us nowhere good, which is partly why I've done this, the analysis. And another thing that I've shown with the analysis is that uh, even if you're a conservative hawk, you can still have military reductions and be at war at the same time. Not that I want to go there, but I, I think that people need to see that it's possible to reduce um, fuel use and emissions. Okay. Um, and then I have the technical slides in case somebody wants to go through the technical stuff. But I'll, I'll stop there and, and answer any questions that you might have or give you my optimistic take, despite all that in the back. How, do the, how does the use of drones affect? Um... Right, drones are more efficient because they're lighter. Mm -hmm. And um, they're lighter for a couple of reasons. They're smaller usually. Some are quite large, but in the, um, in the ones that are used to uh, not just do surveillance, but targeted killings, or they have weapons and they're heavy and so on, but they're still lighter than aircraft. So if you're interested in fuel economy, you'd be all in favor of drones rather than manned aircraft. But if you have other concerns like ethics and assassination, then maybe you wouldn't be so concerned. And there's also, uh, th then you would be more concerned. 
Um, so I have those concerns. So, so what's absent here, though, is an analysis by the DOD of two things. Um, one, their contribution, and secondly, a rethinking of their missions, including the mission of protecting oil. So um, you have the drones in part because you want to protect oil, right, and so on. And, uh, and these regions which are crucial to protecting the governments that are crucial in protecting your access to oil. But if we need less oil, do we need those missions is the thing that we need to be asking. There's another question. I think. Um, there was a question back there, yes. So, um, so here in Maine, we have Bath Iron Works. Um, we used, um, is it Heidi Peltier's um, yes. work? We're very proud of that work, and we talk about it all the time. Great. Um, She'll be glad to hear that. She works with me now. At, uh, BU. Love her, love her, love that work. And so we're always talking about how many more jobs we could um, we could have in the state of Maine if we were producing something other than um, uh, destroyers, destroyers in, at Bath Iron Works. Yeah. Um, but I'm looking at your numbers in terms of the, the, the one previous to this, the slide previous to this, the amount of emissions from military industry, right? So we don't want to be producing military products, we want to be producing windmills, solar panels, you name it. Right. Um, so that will, that will create more jobs, but I'm not hearing that it would necessarily do anything to reduce emissions. Or is that not connected to this? It is connected. It's likely, and I haven't done the math on this, so I'm guessing, that military industrial production is more greenhouse gas intensive. And that's one thing. Uh, and then secondly, if you were producing something like solar panels or windmills or geothermal or heat pumps, over the long run, you'd get a dip in emissions and, uh, you know, or you'd be net neutral, right, because you'd be offsetting. Um, but there has to be a road from here to there. What's the transitional path? for these industries to produce, produce something more useful. And, and uh, there'd be a big incentive if they could no longer make destroyers. They, had, they could make something else. They've got great capacity to do that, great skills. There was another question. What do you do to diminish the need to use carbon-based fuels? Makes us more safe. It makes it more likely that we'll have the leverage we need to reduce the military budget. And it could be used in another way. Good military Thank you.